Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest talk. And this is going to be a very focused talk. It's going to be on CT of chromophobe renal cell carcinomas. I think it's probably going to be three parts. I'm going to tell you everything you always wanted to know about chromophobe renal cell carcinoma, some of the important clinical features, some of the imaging features, and I'm going to show you a whole bunch of cases. Now, there was an excellent article in the New England Journal of Medicine and in JAMA, this one's in JAMA, about renal cell carcinoma. 434,000 plus cases worldwide uh, in 2022, sixth most common cancer amongst males and ninth most common among females in the United States. When we talk about renal cell carcinoma, Typically, we're thinking about clear cell renal cell carcinoma, which makes up maybe 75 to 80 percent of cases. We then also talk about papillary renal cell carcinoma, which we say makes up perhaps 10 to 15 percent of cases. And the last thing we'll typically mention is chromophobe renal cell carcinoma, which typically makes up about 5 percent of cases. Now, we know, and I've given talks before about clear cell, that they're typically hypervascular, neovascularity. Ideally, patients can get a partial nephrectomy, but they may need to get a total nephrectomy. The tumors can recur quickly or over many years. We talk about how metastatic tumor to the pancreas occurs a minimum of 10 years after initial diagnosis. In this article from JAMA, Rose and Kim made some very good points. Clear cell, 75 to 80 percent. Papillary, as I mentioned, 10 to 15. And chromophobe is 5 percent. Clear cell has this loss of the von Hippel-Lindau gene, which is very important. And a lot of the new therapies being developed are trying to take advantage of this. They're also trying to look at, is there a genetic way of fixing that problem? In terms of renal cell carcinoma, we know the classic triad, flank pain, abdominal mass, and hematuria is really uncommon. Less than 10% of cases, the majority of cases we pick up with renal cell these days, up to say 60%, some articles say 70%, are going to be incidental findings. So it's very important that you look at the scans carefully, not just the scans with hematuria or suspected renal cell carcinoma, but all scans. Obviously, if you think there's a potential renal cell carcinoma, you'll get a multi-phase acquisition, typically non-contrast, arterial through the entire abdomen, venous through the kidneys and to the crest, and then excretory phase imaging. We talk about the excretory, particularly important when we think about transitional cell carcinoma. So again, you know, it's very important protocols. The article also makes the point, gross hematuria is reported in less than 25% of patients and occurs more often in advanced disease. Approximately 1.3% of patients with gross hematuria are diagnosed with renal cell carcinoma. So that indeed becomes very important. We see lots of patients with hematuria. And remember, we always speak about gross or microscopic. The microscopic, the likelihood it's inflammatory. Gross hematuria is more likely to be neoplastic. But again, it's only a small percent of patients with gross hematuria that actually end up with a renal cell carcinoma. Now, when you talk about chromophobe, which is what we're going to focus on, it's the third most common. It typically tends to be larger, and even though it's larger, it can be resected. Often heterogeneous, but can be homogeneous. Its peak enhancement is 60 to 80 Hounsfield units nephrographic 60, 80, excretory, so it enhances in kind of a delayed fashion. We talk about the average clear cell being 130 to 150 or more, and we talk about the papillary 70 to 90. So you can see there is some overlap, 
but it's interesting that chromophobes do not do a whole lot of enhancing and do not change a lot between the different phases. Now, one of the reasons, of course, it's important to be not just say there's a renal mass present is because how we plan on surgery will be very dependent. If you have a chromophobe and it's borderline partial nephrectomy, you might do it. But if you have a clear cell, you're just going to do a total nephrectomy. So it's very important for us to really understand and be able to choose specifically in most cases what the tumor is going to be. Now, we talk about chromophobes, that the subtype is derived from cells of the distal convoluted tubules of the nephron, in contrast to clear cell, which arises from the proximal tubules. Despite the presentation, chromophobes are large tumors, which is kind of interesting because they tend to do well. So they have a low metastatic potential. That becomes very, very important. We also observe that in clear cell, lower BMI and male gender were associated with decreased survival, but this was not the case when you look at chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. So it's very, very important. It's interesting, we are learning a lot more about all the tumor types. The pathogenesis of chromophobe remains unclear, but current data suggests two potential mechanisms the mTORC1 hyperactivation through PTEN pathway mutations and mitochondrial dysfunction leading to oxidative stress. There are no specific approved treatments for chromophobe, although people have used tyrosine kinase inhibitors as one example. Response to immunotherapy is generally limited, though there are new immunotherapies that are being developed. So we will see precisely how well we can do, but right now the way to treat chromophobe is with surgery. Now there's been several articles. Here was an article published uh, a few years back in radiographics talking about chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. They made the point the incidence of renal cell over 400,000, and again, 5% of these tumors are gonna be chromophobe, which means about 30 to 50 cases in the US. The mean age for chromophobe is not much different than other renal tumors. It's in the late 50s with a slight male uh, predilection. Now we talk about these chromophobes and again, surgical resection is the main way of treating it. Again, we mentioned, and I'll show you examples, how these tumors can be very large. They're typically relatively hypovascular, remember enhancing only to 80, but sometimes they're more vascular, but still aggressive surgical management is definitely the way to go. The most common imaging pattern is a predominantly solid renal mass with circumscribed margins and enhancement less than that of the renal cortex. That's a very important finding because obviously clear cell enhances far more than the renal cortex and typically papillary is about the level or above the renal cortex as well. Simple example. Now remember I said the tumors are large. Here's one that's only about 3 cm, but there's some borderline changes in increased density on the non-contrast scans with the mean being 33 Hounsfield units. When you give IV contrast arterial phase, the mass does enhance, but not significantly. The cortex, the cortex at the cortical medullary junction is brighter than the tumor. You can see the tumor is only enhancing up to 66 Hounsfield units on the early images. You can see as we go through venous, it's well-defined, but not very vascular. Here it is again on Venus in the coronal view. And you could see it's only 60, hasn't changed much. And then when you go to excretory phase, it drops down to about 49. So now you had a tumor that enhanced a little bit, but didn't get much higher than the high 60s and dropped from Venus to delayed. So again, could this be a papillary? I would say yes. Papillary is well-defined, often small, and not very vascular. But this actually, when you go just by the numbers, 
is actually lower in attenuation and density than most papillary tumors. So a real good example, this patient would get a partial nephrectomy for a chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. And here it is in its relationship to the calyces on the imaging at five minutes. Now, we mentioned that chromophobe is often detected as an incidental finding and less commonly manifests with clinical symptoms. And again, we did say that the majority of renal cells are going to be incidental findings. When they do have symptoms, it varies. Abdominal or flank pain, a mass, sometimes the tumors are large, as we mentioned, hematuria, and systemic symptoms such as fever, cachexia, fatigue, and weight loss do occur. Most of the tumors with chromophobe are low stage of diagnosis, reflecting both, both the indolent nature of the tumor as well as early detection. Lymph node and distant metastasis are infrequent well in the single digits. And in fact, the low single digits, when you do get METs, it's to liver and lung. So what you can see is if you can resect the tumor, the patient should be doing very, very well. And that indeed becomes very important. Now, when we talk about renal cell and we talk about chromophobe, we talk about the point that um, it's more common in patients with BHD uh, than in the general population. We also talk about the fact that chromophobes can be bilateral, but they're usually unilateral, okay? So it's something at least to consider, but essentially any renal tumor from renal cell to, uh, that's clear cell to papillary to chromophobe, though papillary is probably the least common to occur multiple. In terms of size range, this article by Marco, mean size from 3.2 to 7 centimeters. Enhancement may be homogeneous or heterogeneous. Uh, we may see calcification or a central scar. Though most of the time, my experience is that it's often very homogeneous and not very much enhancing, but it's solid. And that allows me to think of that possibility. And again, peak enhancement occurs in the nephrographic phase, and then it washes out like the case I showed you a little bit ago. We mentioned, again, the size can be variable, but it's often smooth margins. They're solid. They can be necrotic, but that's uncommon. Up to one third of cases have calcification, though I think in my experience, it's less frequent. And they do, in about a third of cases or less, have a scar. But again, the calcifications and the scar are indeed going to be very, very variable. Now, as I mentioned, we do see enhancement across the phases, but the enhancement is going to be no more than 80 Hounsfield units and will drop, drop off from nephrographic as you go to excretory phase. There's no single imaging finding that's path pneumonic for a uh, chromophobe renal cell carcinoma, but understanding the features about a solid tumor, not very vascular, no neovascularity for the most part, and again, the well-defined margins and often a larger tumor can very much help you make the diagnosis. So it can be very, very challenging. Now, most of the time, chromophobes will not spontaneously bleed. I think I have one case that I'll show you a little bit later with spontaneous bleeding, but that's fairly uncommon. Clear cell is more common to spontaneously bleed because it's much more vascular than the other tumors. So that indeed becomes very, very important. And again, um, in terms of prognosis, the prognosis of chromophobe renal cell carcinoma is typically better than other tumors. And you can see some of the data, and this radiographics article is well worth looking at. So it's something, again, that's very, very important. And so knowledge of the clinically indolent behavior and expected imaging pattern of chromophobe renal cells will aid the radiologist in the evaluation of a solid renal mass detected at imaging. Again, the point being, we want to be really good at not just detecting tumors, but being very specific what the tumors are.
So that indeed becomes very important to us. Now, we did write an article on chromophobe way back when. This is going back more than a dozen years. And it's funny, our experience wasn't significantly different, more common in men than in women. None of the patients had evidence of distant metastatic disease, either on initial staging or over the follow-up, which was just for a couple of years. Tumor maximum diameter was about 5.2, 46% were homogeneous, 85% of lesions were either completely solid or mostly solid, 14% had calcification, 34% central scar or necrosis. And the attenuation values, you can see it was highest early, but did not reach 90 Hounsfield units and did wash out. So again, very, very important findings and things to remember. Now, chromophobes were found to have a wider variability of CT features than previously reported, but you can see after we reported this information, as people got more experience, remember that radiographics article I showed you is almost a decade later, and their results were very similar to our results. So with that, why don't we stop here? I've given you a lot of facts, a lot of things to think about. What we'll do in part two of this talk is look at a few more statistics think a little bit more about the tumor, and then look at a lot of sample cases. So I'll see you in a few minutes. Catch you later. Bye. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.